Hello, I'm Lisa Harrison and today I'm talking to Mark Darwin, Aussie founder of truthology.com.au. Is that right, Mark? Correct. Uh, no, sorry, it's uh, .org.au. Oh, .org okay. Yes. And Mark, I have to say that I wish, wish the Truthology was around about 18 months ago when I first dug my way down this particular rabbit warren. Yep. It would have shortened my learning curve by a good six months. And so I'm very grateful that you've put this together. But before we explain what Truthology is and what it is you're trying to achieve, um, I want to talk a little bit about your background prior to Truthology, yep. professionally. Um, who were you? What were you doing? Uh, well, probably best to go back to, to my childhood, where you know where our parents mucked us up. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I was brought up in a... Um, you know, uh, a house of tyranny, I would say. My father was a very strict old school uh, man and he drove into me from a very early age the importance of status uh, and money and education and your career and your position in life. And um, so I went to, uh, you know, a, a private school uh, and the whole time my father drove me, uh, not from a position of, um, from love, from a position of fear. You will succeed or there will be repercussions, you know. So. It's interesting that, um, you know, I think when we're born beautiful babies, we think that our parents are God. They're all that we know. They feed us, they house us, and, and so we accept everything as gospel. And then as we grow up, we see their infallibilities. And, and so uh, I saw a lot of those from an early age. My mother was a chronic alcoholic, and there was a lot of things that I started questioning from an early age, which I'm actually now very grateful for. Certainly not um, wanting to sound like a victim. I'm actually now extremely grateful because from an early age, I started asking lots of questions around why. And I think, um, you know, when we do our workshops, that's one of the things that I ask people to do is just pretend they're four years old for the day uh, because what does a four-year-old ask all day long that drives you crazy is why. Why? Um, but it all makes sense in hindsight, doesn't it, when you look back and you see the, the foundations that that laid for who yes. you are and where you are at. Yeah, absolutely. So I left school and became a chef. Um, and then within a few years, had my own restaurant up here in Brisbane in 1988. If you remember, in 88 was Expo 88, so I had a uh, massive restaurant here. But um, that was probably my first little downfall that happened at an early age, 21 I think I was, uh, because what happened was I opened it six months before Expo, and then when Expo started, all the restaurants around town died. Nobody saw it coming. Expo became its own little city, and everybody that visited, um, uh, including the locals, took their friends, and Expo took all the business. So I lost that, uh, lost that restaurant. I didn't, didn't lose a whole amount, amount of money, but I lost a fair bit of pride. And um, uh, so that was, that was great. But look, I, I got a job in real estate there. There was some people from LJ Hooker that used to eat at the restaurant. They gave me a job in real estate. So I think, Lisa, most people have done some hospitality and some real estate somewhere along the line, haven't they? Well, I can, I can add to the hospitality, yeah. Yeah, most people have done something there. Um, and look, real estate was a fantastic way to enter business because it was in the late 80s. Things were absolutely booming up here in Queensland. Um, and, uh, and that changed really quickly. You know, we went from booming to bust in a matter of weeks. And everyone should remember that because that's, that's what's going to happen again when it happens. It's going to happen very quickly. So interest rates went, uh, um, I'm sure you remember, to 19, 20 and 21%. Yes, I do. Uh, and uh, the market just crashed. The recession we and, had to have. Uh, yes. And I'll ask everyone to think now, imagine if interest rates went to 19 or 20 percent now. I mean, it's just, it's just you can't even contemplate that, not, that happening. Not with the, but, I mean, the uh, housing prices of, since the late 80s have mm. you know, gone through the roof. Yeah. Um, having a two or $300,000 mortgage back then at 18 to 21 percent was one thing. Having a seven or $800,000 mortgage as people have got now at 18 to 20 percent, that's a whole other ballgame. Absolutely. Absolutely. So real estate was great, but when the market crashed, I then went to Sydney. I got offered a job with Bond Media, Alan Bond, mm -hmm. and uh, put, in, put in Movie Link to all the four and five star hotels. I don't know, you know, I'm sure most people have seen Movie Link in there now. So we did that, which was great. Uh, then the Bond Empire crashed because Alan was buying $20 million paintings with shareholders' money and all that sort of stuff. And I have to say, as an insider there, there was no accountability in that, in that firm. None. I mean, I was a 22 year old and they said, here's your wage, which was ridiculous, and no, no expense accounts had to be put in, nothing. Crazy stuff. But uh, the bad 80s, the big bad 80s. <laughs> um, and then from there, I went to A.V. Jennings, the uh, proud old builder, 
and uh, went into their finance division and that's where I started to get uh, a bit of an understanding on finance and how money works and then got headhunted to Aussie Home Loans uh, and was there from the early days and um, that, was, that was a fantastic opportunity to be part of a company that um, was a fledgling company to when I left it was a household name and it was an extremely exciting time to be part of that. Um, but it was, it was in that time that I started to question a lot of things about money. You know, I understood interest and I understood uh, um, uh, the term of a loan and amortization and, and ca capitalism and how things could work theoretically. But uh, I don't know if you know, Lisa, Aussie pioneered securitized lending in Australia. And securitized lending is where you establish a bond. Okay, so without being too boring here, just picture a bond as a warehouse. And we would say, look, we're going to build a $300 million warehouse. We'd fill that warehouse full of mortgages. So we'd go out and see the, the Mars and Pars and uh, sign them up on their mortgages. And once we had $300 million in mortgages, we'd then go and sell that bond on the bond market. And uh, I thought to myself at the time, chronologically, how did we do that? How did we have the money to give to these people for their, to buy their houses and then go and sell that on the bond market? We didn't buy the bond and therefore have the money. And uh, I said that to the powers that be there, and they said to me, welcome to the magic of banking. They literally, that was my first taste in understanding that they literally make money out of thin air. And then they go and sell it again on the bond market. So that was uh, how securitized lending really took off in Australia, or the subprime market, which is responsible for a lot of the things that are going on right now. But I left Aussie and started a wealth creation company. And I know just before we went on air, you were talking about uh, the fact that a lot of people in this industry have had some taste of working in the wealth uh, industry. So uh, that went fantastic. That was in the, in the late 90s. And um, we were very fortunate in that we had a lot of the Aussie Home Loans guys send us a lot of business. And uh, so the business went uh, great guns. I sold out of that and went into retirement at the age of, how old was I, 32. And uh, moved to the Gold Coast and bought a big waterfront home and motorbikes and started playing golf and got bored with that really quickly. Um, and so my partner at the time, uh, had a business, um, she had quite a few sort of um, health uh, stores and around Surface Paradise and we created, do you, I don't know if you remember 10 or 12 years ago, Lisa, bath bombs and um, somehow or another we presented to Woolies and Coles and got it into Woolies and Coles and then it went, it just went into everywhere and we ended up with a big factory with 50 odd staff up here on the Gold Coast and, and then sending it overseas and uh, we then went into fundraising, fundraising is a huge industry. Um, and we designed a huge bath bomb that looked like a Toblerone, and we called it a not a chocolate bomber blocker, <laughs> like a lolly gobble bliss bomb, something that the kids would struggle to get their heads around. So we had Grant Hackett as our ambassador for that, and we sent money to Kids Helpline. Um, so it was just had a really good set of ingredients. We then franchised it, and that was the disaster for us. Um, I think most of the things that I'd touched before that had turned to gold. But uh, we sold 14 franchises in three months, and for anyone who's in business would know that that's far too many, so the business grew too quickly, um, and essentially, not to bore everybody, but within 18 months it went from a multi-million dollar, hugely successful business to totally imploding. Um, and uh, that's probably one of the times in my life where, as you said before, uh, people seem to need to go through a dip, and you know, we have our successes and we have our, uh, our shortfalls in life, and certainly for me, I've learned more about myself in those shortfalls at, at two o'clock in the morning when you're looking at yourself in the mirror going, how did this happen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see you acknowledging, uh, I think most people have looked at themselves at two in the morning going, gee, uh -huh. <laughs> everything was going so well, what happened? Uh, anyway, look, that was a really tough time for me, Lisa. It was uh, so much so that because my father had ingrained into me that success and status and money was everything, um, you know, there's a few times I actually thought about checking out. I couldn't even face my family at the time and my friends. It was a uh, very, very tough time. So I did what I did comfortably. Uh, we all do what go back to our comfort zone, don't we, I think, in, in times like that. So I went back to wealth creation and started a company that was really um, starting to, to go okay. And then uh, I developed a brain tumour. And um, uh, one of my favourite sayings is, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Mm -hmm. And uh, so at that time, you know, uh, the medical industry told me they wanted to cut, burn and zap. Otherwise, I'd be gonski in 18 months to two years. Um, but I'd never, I never really believed in the medical industry. I've got four kids; three of them were born at home. I delivered three of them at home, so I've, I've really been into no immunisation and 
uh, self-healing. And so at that time, very luckily met Don Tolman. I don't know if the people out there have heard of Don Tolman. He, he does a lot of healing with whole food. And, I'm very and, aware um, of Don Tolman. I used to eat pulse oh, great. and all of that stuff. Yep. Pulse, yeah, pulse. So, um, so I, I went totally vegetarian for 12 months and I started uh, sitting Vipassana meditation, which are 10-day retreats where you sit in silence. And without any medical intervention, I healed myself. And that was an extraordinarily empowering experience to know that I'm responsible. And so it's a lot of what we talk about now is self-responsibility, accepting oneself as cause. Where did the tumor come from? You know, it came from my activities, probably my diet, having too much of a mobile phone next to my head for hours on end, and I, I had to take responsibility for where that was at. But uh, uh, a few years after that, I went to a seminar, this was probably about two and a half years ago, uh, that was about sovereignty. So uh, being independent and not reliant on a system, um, although now we're learning that sovereignty is actually just the highest form of a slave, <laughs> but uh, a lot of people have a certain idea about what it is, but it was, it was one of those seminars, Lisa, that the whole day my jaw was dropped. And I, 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 I consider myself reasonably learned. I've read a lot. I've, um, I've tried to, uh, I've attended every course under the sun, but this, this uh, seminar was the biggest eye-opener of my life. And... It, um, it really crystallized a lot of uh, uh, the public and private you that we'll probably talk a little bit about, uh, the establishment of um, trusts that we're not aware of, and your birth certificate is a certificate, a warehouse receipt for that trust that you're not even the trustee of, the creation of money, um, the application of interest, and all these things. So it was a, it was a, a seminar where I, uh, I got home that night. I couldn't sleep. I started spending 16 to 18 hours a day researching online and reading um, articles and papers um, and I have to say I went to to a state of um, I guess mild depression for about two or three months um, I had to walk away from the wealth creation company that I was involved with I was the majority shareholder and and it was starting to go great guns we had a re really good relationship with kids helpline again and my other partners thought I was mad they you know here's this wealth creator who was with us in the heyday and all of a sudden he's saying you know the creation of money is is evil the way that they've applied it is uh um not helpful for people capitalism is designed to fail and so my business partners thought mark's mark's lost the plot yeah <laughs> uh, and, but i couldn't sit lisa any longer and and sell something that i knew was absolutely mathematically designed to fail uh and interestingly you know a lot of the uh that the people and at the time money wasn't so easy to get things were tightening up this was two years ago and so this was just before the GFC and um, you know where people would have plenty of equity before and plenty of income now things were really really tight and you could see things starting to, to contract um, so uh, look I had four four other business partners in that wealth creation company we're all driving around in new Audis looking like wankers sorry I just said a naughty word but um, uh, I have to say that two of them over time have since started to research this information and now on board with it. Uh, mm. But the, the other couple are, I think they intellectually understand that everything that, you know, this truth movement has some legs, but they, they're in this really tormented space of, of uh, still having to push forward with that and try and make that work. So I think once people come across this information, and we'll get into detail, but the ones who can't go where you've gone who can't really let go are still coming from a very I'm going to use you know these terms 3d ego space because it's been ingrained to be on top to be successful to be better than and you're and we're all trained to judge ourselves by judging others and by comparison so what I've noticed is it, it doesn't matter the level of education, it doesn't matter the academic and business kind of background and qualifications. If you can't go from a heart space, from a more spiritual perspective, then you don't really see the bigger picture in this. And that's mm -hmm. what holds you, holds you there. Um, because all they're seeing is right here, right now, money is what counts. Mm -hmm. um, not seeing the bigger picture of, of the fact that it's actually all coming down. It's all it's all breaking down. Mm. Very quickly. <laughs> Very quickly. Well, and as I, as we did talk about before we um, started recording was that a common theme that I've noticed 
in this down this particular rabbit hole is that there's two things really one is that regardless of where people have come from and a lot of people have come from wealth they've lost everything mm. as it stands today they've got very little if nothing at all or they're in big trouble mm -hmm. and the other thing is watching them go through the stages of grief that are very similar to the stages of grief when you're told you have a, an illness or someone's about to die or has died that initial one is disbelief they cannot get their head around the fact that there is a system that is so I want to say evil because I think ultimately it is that is so corrupt that is so designed against you that it, there's just disbelief yeah. then there is anger because you realize what a victim you've been of the system from the day you were born then there is some form of acceptance and I watch people over and over and over again go through that cycle. Mm -hmm. It's quite, it's quite, um, oh, you can almost set your clock by it. Yes. You know, come back and talk to me next week and I know where you'll be at. Yeah. You know. I agree. Yeah, I think the school system has a lot to do with that. I mean, oh, um, absolutely. You know, the school put you in uniforms and uni means one. Then you go off to university, uni meaning one, one version of information. And you know, you have to look at the his the his story history that they shove down your throat. Well, whose story is it? It's the story that's designed to have good little tax paying citizens come out and uh, and not question the system. So I think that's where most people end up. But you're absolutely right. We have a lot of clients come to us, Lisa, and uh, I would say, and I'm guessing here, uh, about eighty percent of the clients come to us in extreme financial uh, pain, about to lose their home, credit cards maxed out, and just to give you some figures. Um, I think the record uh, of one client alone coming to us had 268,000 in credit card debts, just in credit card debts. Then he had two car loans, one for he and one for his wife, and a few homes. The investment homes had 40 to 45% losses since the, he had purchased them, like they'd come back in price. Um, just an absolute mess, effectively bankrupt, as, as the system would see. Mm. Uh, so, uh, you know, and uh, we've had clients... Um, Come to workshops and then go home and tell their friends. And one client rang us and said, I've got a friend who's uh, in dire need. He really needs to come and see you guys. Uh, and three days later, that, that guy hung himself. He actually hung himself because he couldn't even face his wife at the fact that they were going to lose, lose their house. And so this is, this is what drives us to have people wake up to the fact that it's, uh, it's not even them, them that has the debt. Any spiritual leader or, or sage will tell you that we can't be indebted. And that's, that's why they've created up. Uh, this this trust or this corporate you that has the debt because we can't be indebted. So, what is okay? What did you learn? What was the what was the first thing that you learnt that had your jaw on the ground and your head spinning and opened your eyes? Uh. I think, as you said before, the biggest thing for me, because I, um, I like to consider myself reasonably intelligent, was the fact that I didn't see uh, the deceit and the systems that had been set up, especially around the creation of a uh, corporate you or a nom de guerre uh, entity through your birth certificate, and that that's, that's how they trade you. Now, so, for people who know nothing about any of that, okay, what... How, how do you find is the best way to explain that? Because I mean, I've, I've done it to, for several people and had them sitting there in front of their driver's license and their birth certificate and their credit cards and whatever and, and in disbelief that there's something in it. But, so the way that I've explained it, um, that people, most people understand, is that everything's based on uh, a, a court. If there's going to be an adjudication on something, it's on court. Now, the highest document in court is the Bible. So whether people believe in the Bible or not, if you want to go to a court that's a Roman court, and all the courts around the world are Roman courts, uh, you, they will ask you to swear an oath on the Bible, and they use a lot of the principles in the Bible. Now, the Bible says, and I'm not a Bible basher. In fact, I sit for Parshana, and I try to follow the teachings of the Buddha. But I understand that the Bible is used in law. So the Bible says, and actually most, most uh, uh, people who believe in spirit will agree, that there is a divine creator. Now, they call it God. There's a divine creator that then allegedly created man. Okay, so if we're talking about a master-servant relationship, 
we're God's gracious servants and he's the master. And it actually says in 1 Samuel chapter 8 that we're to report to one master and to no other. Be wary of appointing a king, a king or a government, etc. So we're to report to the master. Then man in his infinite wisdom, as populations grew and we needed infrastructure, we created government to govern us. Yeah. So the government was originally of the people, for the people, by the people. But when the, uh, the cabal or these, uh, the Illuminati or whatever you want to call them realized that they wanted to maintain control over us, because for centuries they'd done it through brute force. Might was right. Um, and when the, the pen was becoming mightier than the sword, they needed to create a way to control this. So they then created corporate government. Okay, so all the governments around the world, whether they're federal or state, are now registered as corporations. And I encourage people to look it up. The Commonwealth of Australia is a proprietary limited company. Uh, it's registered here and in the United States. Queensland government's the Brigolo Corporation. People can look this up. So that's how they trade. The New South Wales Police Force is a proprietary limited company with an ABN. All of these institutions are corporations. So they set up then corporate government. They then set us up as a corporate person. And if you look at the Black's Law Legal Dictionary, which is what they use in the courts, a person can be a company or a corporation. So through the establishment of your birth certificate, they've set up what's called a Sester KB Trust, okay, with them as the trustee, the system as the trustee, and you as the beneficiary. And your birth certificate, which your mother was the informant on, now an informant denotes somebody who's informing of a crime, so your mother was the informant, and your birth certificate is what you then trade through. And so okay, stop, because <laughs> you've just said an awful lot, uh, okay, very sorry. quickly, uh, for people who this is brand new for. Okay. okay, so I'll go, back, I'll go back to the master-servant. God is the master, we're the servant. We've then created government. Now, what, 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 what have we called government people? What are they known as? Public servants. servants. Does it feel that way? Not at all. No, it doesn't feel that way, does it? No. <laughs> when the ATO call you and say, where's your tax return? Who, who's serving who? Uh, and so then that's what I, what I was trying to say there is they then created a corporate government and a corporate you because it's all about who's the master and the servant. Now, when they've set up you as a corporate person, you come under the corporate government. They have what's called jurisdiction. Asian is to speak. Juris is the law. So they have the law uh, to speak un to you under you, right? Oh, sorry, on top of you. You you are under their jurisdiction. Your person is under their jurisdiction. So what so I encourage. So let's just get some background here. What I encourage people to do is get a copy of Black's Law Dictionary if you have other. never done this before. And there are multiple versions of it on the internet that you can download. And if you go back to the older versions, what you'll see is in each successive version, things are changed, things are removed. Yeah. Um, but look up some key words. Look up the word understand. There's a mm -hmm. great place to start. Because what you will notice yep. is that when you walk into a courtroom, the first, one of the first things you will be asked is if you understand the charges. Now, mm -hmm. most of us... Look, at, look into a Webster Dictionary, for example, and you'll see that understand is to comprehend, and that's what we think mm -hmm. we're being asked. Do we comprehend the charges? It's not what we're being asked at all. We're being asked if we will stand under them, if we will literally have those charges hanging over our head. Um, Correct. Look up the word person, as Mark said. It doesn't mean what you think it means. It doesn't not mean a human being or an individual or a... Um, a pers living person, living human being, I should say. Um, what, are what are some other key words that can blow people's mind when they look them up in Law's Dictionary? Um, Actually, look well, up human, it's, it's for not, that matter. It says monster, doesn't it? Yeah, human being's not us either. We're sentient, we're sentient, flesh and blood, spirit-filled beings. That's what we are. Uh, look, they've messed with a whole heap of words, and it's amazing how, through, through the indoctrination of the education uh, system, we just give them a certain meaning. So the word normal has a certain meaning. The word abnormal has the opposite. Ab makes it the opposite. So I wonder why they call them aborigines. They're telling them they're not origines, and therefore they have no rights. Um, you know, the word commonwealth. Everyone thinks the commonwealth, the commonwealth court, the commonwealth games. Commonwealth means the sweat and flesh of the slave. <laughs> the commonwealth, <laughs> yes. Right. It's the flesh and sweat of the slave. So when we want to, we want Commonwealth jurisdiction. We're telling them that we're happy for them to treat us as a slave. So what look, people really, lot. I think what people really need to get a handle on is that when we go to school and we are taught what the words, of, the meanings of words, we are taught from a particular uh, yes. dictionary, so to speak. It's a particular language. 
And yet, when we are out in the world, when we are being spoken to by a corporation, by a government, by a police force, by a court, by any of these corporate organisations, they are literally speaking a different language. And it's yes. one that we were never taught. It's one yep. we're not encouraged to investigate. Um, and you can receive a letter in the mail from a court or from a a police officer or from a corporation and you will think it says something because you're reading it in mm. English that you were taught at school mm -hmm. when the document can be saying something completely different um, mm -hmm. and also in this legal jargon things like having things in a box in brackets means something mm. um, in fact it means that it doesn't mean anything it means that it's not there you can it disregard it means that it can't be seen and it's not admissible. Anything in a box. Yeah, um, or in brackets can, or inverted commas. Yes. And you can take that analogy to court as well. You've got a witness in a box. You've got a jury in a box. You've, which means that the judge can completely ignore them, not see them. They are not there. It doesn't have to take anything that they say or think or feel or do into consideration if he chooses not to. They are in a box. There is. This is a, a very long winding rabbit hole, rabbit warren, really. Um, and one of the things that I've learnt over the last 18 months in particular is that we have a huge awakening, as we all know, on this planet right now. The whole world's waking up. And there are different camps to that. You know, there are, there's the New Age movement. And for me, that represents people waking up to the fact that they are just more than their human body that they are a, a spiritual being having a, a human experience. Mm -hmm. Then there is another camp, which is the Ascension camp for me. And that is a much larger, broader, deeper perspective on things. And then you've got this other camp, which is the Truth Movement camp. And within that Truth Movement camp, you, you sort of have lots of sub-branches. There's the understanding that the Illuminati actually exist that it's real, it's not just a conspiracy theory. There's understanding the New World Order and what it really is trying to achieve, what its plans are. Then there is this other road you can go down, which is understanding the fraud, the mat what I call the matrix. And the, the, this, this matrix includes the banking fraud and the political fraud and the government fraud and, and the way that we have been um, seen, sorry? Deceived. Deceived, absolutely. So one of the things you understand when you go down this road is that a corporation cannot deal with a human being. It can only deal with another corporation. So the corporation known as your, your country, what you think is your government, in this case the Commonwealth of Australia, we think is a government. It's not, it's a corporation. And it can only deal with other corporations. So in order to deal with us, it needed to create a corporate version of us and that is your token for that the the evidence of that is your name in all capital letters and if you look at your bank statements if you look at your credit cards if you look at your social security cards if you look at your anything anything issued by a corporation it will have your name capitalized in some form What's it called? Capitus Dominicus? Capitus Diminutius Maximus, which means uh, you have no rights. Mm. <laughs> it's essentially you're it's a corporation. A corporation is a dead man speaking. Corpus is dead. Asian is to speak. Uh, or a nom de guerre, which is a French war term for a dead. You're dead. Mm. So uh, you're either a corporation or a dead man when you walk into court. Which was something that was initially used with slaves only, I believe. That in mm. The slaves were the only people who had their names in all capital letters. And all capital letters is maximum um, removal of your status. Just your first, the first letter of your first and second name is the, the, the minimum um, that they can deplete your status as a human being and right up until absolute everything's in capital letters. So that some birth certificates now, Lisa, are being um, released in upper and lower case, which is interesting, mm -hmm. but they've written written in cursive, and to cursive is to speak to the devil, and uh, either way, the whole birth certificate's in a box, and anything in a box can't be seen or heard. It's not admissible, so it's all fiction. It's all to do with fact and fiction. They're fictitious courts dealing with fictitious corporations, um, and so even you turning up to court is almost a sign of your incompetence. Yes, and mm. 
hiring a lawyer or having somebody represent you is absolute. Um, you've given the ball, you've given the game away from the moment you walk in the door. So I, I've had some, I've had some fun in court it, because I know who I am. I've had a couple of fun experiences in court. That's the most common phrase that I have heard since going down this road is you have to know who you are. And as I said before about these different camps, New Age Ascension and Truth Movement, for me, which is surprising, I have actually had some of the most spiritual understandings and awakenings in the Truth Movement rather than even the Ascension and New Age um, paths because it opens your eyes to really, really getting to the, the depths of you having to ask the questions about who you are in order to, like you say, stand up in court or deal with a corporation. You have to know who you are. Um, but what, moving on to truthology as such, what prompted you to, to go about and create tr truthology? How did that come about? Uh, well, after I came across the information and spent about three months researching, I, um, I essentially, as soon as I attended that workshop, I, within a week, walked away from the financial planning business. I then spent a lot of time researching, and then I thought, right, what am I going to do with my life? Um, and uh, I felt a really strong urge, because I've done a little bit of public speaking and, and so forth, to just share the information. And so, essentially, we just started doing little workshops. Uh, that went from sort of 8 to 10 people to 15 to 25 to 60 people really, really quickly. Um, then we started doing twice a month and uh, uh, I, I guess then we really wanted to put the processes in place because there's a lot, lot of this information out there, Lisa, but not, not so much, well then great, now what do I do with it? Um, and that can be a frustrating place. People, people understand that there's been a, a corporate them set up, they understand that the banks create money out of nothing, but what to do? What to do about that? So. We um, put together a, a couple of um, processes for handling debt honourably by asking the bank certain questions that they can't answer and still today haven't answered. And we're also showing people how uh, they can set up not-for-profit foundations and operate privately out of the public system. Um, and I'm guessing we've set up probably 200 foundations and done well over 300 debt processes. And um, it's been it's been an amazing experience, as you said, to watch people come to us with their shoulders down, pale in complexion, dark rings under their eyes, marriages falling apart, you know, really just ready to put their hands up and go, what the hell was that all about? To within three months, and as you said before, you can almost set your clock. Within three months, we'd be Steph and I would catch up with them at a cafe, and this has happened a few times. We haven't recognised them. We've been looking around, going, oh, they're not here, and they go, Mark, Steph. It's 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 been a <laughs> a physical and um, and like aura transformation of these people. Their shoulders are back. You know, I'll tell you one. I'm oh, sorry, I'm getting a bit excited now because it's just so lovely to see. We had one guy come to us. He was about 135 kilos, um, not sleeping, working three jobs, marriage on the rocks. Uh, three months later, he was 95 kilos. He had run the Gold Coast half marathon. He and his wife were making love again. They were talking to their kids again, and you know it was just so amazing to watch them wake up to who they are. Um, so I guess what Truthology is is a platform for people to start to take practical steps towards freeing themselves. But I will say um, I've been listening to a lot of trust law stuff through uh, a lovely chap by the name of Franco Collins. And uh, Frank talks all through his talks about there's no magic bullets. And so that's what I want to reiterate here. We haven't got the magic bullet. We've got some processes that have worked really well. Um, uh, but it's, it's really what I've said the whole time we've talked about is this, this is as, as much, if not more, an internal process than an external process. We can help them with the semantics of, uh, of some paperwork and so forth, but they really need to commit to learning who they are and how this system has been set up and how they can deal with it honorably. Uh, so that's, I guess, what Truthology is, is the platform for that. And it's not just about debt, and it's not just about tax. Um, we really do, and we've had a lot of people go and sit for Vipassana meditation courses that have come in contact with us. We've, had, we've turned a lot of people into uh, vegetarians and healthy eaters, people into exercising, meditating. Um, so it, it's a lot more than just the, the semantics of, um, of, of finance and tax and all that sort of stuff.
Is Truthology open to people outside of Australia or is it really just for Australians? We've actually recently just had people joining from the UK, South Africa, New Zealand, um, Germany, uh, all over the place. The paperwork that we have in terms of handling debt is uh, applicable for here and New Zealand now. And now our head um, administrator, Lloyd, is now looking at getting it ready for the UK. Okay. Because they're all, they're, all, they're all from the same base law, but they've all got slightly different acts and statutes that we need to refer to. Yeah. And as, a, as an education platform, um, I think you've done a great job. You know, it's, I can tell you from experience that, <clears throat> you know, I spent six months and at times it was, like you, 12, 14, 16 hour days on the internet researching and having my head <laughs> blown away time and time again. Um, but you've actually made it, been able to con sort of condense the necessary knowledge, which I, and I think it's a really good starting point for people. So if you do not know anything about the subject, if you do not know anything about the straw man, if you do not know anything about uh, the fraudulent banking and financial systems, then this is a great uh, education resource. Um, Mark's done a really good job in setting it up into modules that, that build upon one another. Um, and you can get the education that took me six months, you can get that in a week if you're dedicated and to sit there, or less really, but um, to give yourself a chance to digest it, you know, you could do it in a week. Um, so I want to recommend it, I really do. Um, I think you've done a great job and you explain it very, very well, simply, it's not too convoluted. And you are passionate, I get that. Um, and you see the bigger picture as well, which is, which is nice. And you're not coming from a place of anger or revenge, which unfortunately a lot of people down this road are. Yeah. Um, you're about community and helping people. And I just really want to acknowledge you for that because um, I see a lot of anger. I see a lot of anger down this road. Yeah, there is. And there is some very prominent people in Australia that want to fight the system. You know, they really are quite aggressive and want to fight it. And if you do that, you know, you've got to understand, Lisa, they've got guns and batons and a very corrupt court system and, and they, they will squish you and that's happened. There's been a couple of the freedom fighters here in Australia have been incarcerated for 12 days and 14 days without charge, beaten up, all sorts of stuff. But, but I have to say they've almost drawn that on. Not almost. They have drawn that on. When I go to court, I go with a smile on my face. I go to have some fun, I go to test out a few things, and, um, and I have to say, I, uh, in a cheeky way, I think some of the magistrates and, and judges that have come up with me have enjoyed the experience as well, because they're used to just what they would see as fodder coming through all day, through the sausage factory, you know, um, telling them what to do, and so for somebody to actually challenge them and ask them questions, uh, you know, a few of them have got hot, hot under the collar and... and I've sort of backed them into a corner a few times, but I think at the end of the day, they would have maybe enjoyed a gin and, gin and tonic and gone, well, that was interesting what happened today. Uh, and, you know, we just need more people asking these questions. One of the things you've said a couple of times, Lisa, is um, that I picked up on is that it's a fraudulent system. And I, I uh, have felt that way for a long time, probably until about the last six weeks, when I've really come to the understanding that it's not a fraudulent system. We are ignorant. And we are, we are applying ourselves to, it might be deceptive, but I don't know how fraudulent it is because we apply for a tax file number and to apply means to beg. Mm. We apply for an Australian business number. We apply to want to be part of that system. Um, the, the, the banks don't hide that they make money out of nothing. We, we acquiesce and we go and sign application to beg forms for it. So... I say um, fraud because I believe the very foundation of it is based on a fraud, which is that I am dead. That's yes. a lie. Yes. That I am not a living, breathing, spiritual, sentient being. Yes. It's based on the fact that I am a dead, empty vessel. Yes. And because that's a lie, um, the system is based on a fraud. That's what I mean by that. And absolutely, yep. the, my cooperation is due to my own ignorance, completely. Um, I... So that's what, that's what we join to ourselves to. That's what they want you to do is join to yourselves to that and it's through our ignorance that we do do that. So um, it's really a matter of collapsing that uh, understanding. You, you now coming with true knowledge and understanding and saying, 
I'm now with knowledge and I'm asking you to stop and correct those records because I'm now with knowledge that I am a spirit-filled sentient being. I only report to one master. I don't need to report to you and re-establishing yourself as a living being. Um, it's, uh, it's a really, it's, there's been a really big shift, I have to say, even just in the last six to eight weeks for me to, to come to that conclusion. Um, and it's I, not I'm them quite confident I know where your shift has come from because um, I've been heavily involved in that as well and we'll be talking to him publicly too. Um, yeah, I've been studying been studying trust law for about twelve months through people like Christian Walters and a few others, mm -hmm. but uh, but definitely the chap that you and I are talking about now has uncovered some some information that even in that trust law study arena has been um, you know, pretty huge, and um, and it does it does bear uh, bring to bear that we have been ignorant through all of this. We've been ignorant and we've been the one playing the game. But the exciting thing is that it seems to be coming down rapidly. I don't know about you, Lisa, and, and the listeners, but even just the last three to four weeks has been a huge acceleration in um, in information that I'm being able to absorb. I'm sleeping far less, but I'm okay with that. Uh, I definitely feel a, a super big increase just in the last little while. And apparently, the 9th of March, it's about to amp up again for mm -hmm. everybody, the Mayan Mayan stuff. So the other thing that's up. amped up lately. Um that I can vouch for is what seems to be desperation on the parts of the banks. Um, they are on selling credit card and personal loan and mortgage, well, not so much mortgages, they take you to court for those, but personal loans and credit cards, they are selling them on if you're two months behind in your payments. I mean, it, normally you'd get a couple of late payment notices, they'd, you know, they'd hold on to it and drag you around and try and negotiate with you for a couple of years before they sold your debt on. Um, now, you miss a payment and you're gone. Yeah. Um, there, I, half a dozen people this week alone, it's now Friday, since Monday, that I know of have received writs, statements of claim, warrants, um, notice of on sale of debt, um, some people two, three and four things in the past week. It's, it seems to go in cycles. Um, you know, the phone calls from the credit... Um, credit card companies or the debt collectors that had gone silent for a few months, they've all amped up again this week. It's like they all know something's coming as well and they're trying to get in there and get whatever they can before it comes down. That's what it feels like to me because the last ditch effort. Yes, well we've uh, probably done over 300 matters now and uh, we've only had two, been, two um, mortgages subpoenaed to court. No one else has been summoned to court. They've, uh, they've mostly all been on sold to debt collectors. And we've got a letter that we send debt collectors that every time sends them running because, you know, people need to understand that a debt collector is what they call a third-party interloper. You have no contract with them. That's like if you lent me 100 bucks, Lisa, and I didn't pay you, you then going to get, um, you know, your friend, say, Linda, to come and chase the $100 from me. I don't, I don't have any contract with Linda. I, I might have a contract with you. Um, and that's what a debt collector is. So we've got a very big legal letter that we send debt collectors uh, and seems to get them scurrying. And ordinarily, a debt collector will buy that debt for 10 cents in the dollar, which is at most, through fractional reserve lending, what it would have cost the bank in the first place. So the yeah. bank's not hard. But, uh, yeah, look, there is. Um, we, we, we unfortunately, have, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately, we've only had two clients uh, been summoned to court, and that's only happened in the last couple of weeks, for their mortgages. All the credit cards have gone away. They get a few nasty letters for uh, a couple of months and maybe a few calls from debt collectors, and then they go away. No statements, no nothing. Um, but uh, I am aware of a couple of people, and you and I know one, that have uh, some things going through the court at the moment for mortgages. And there's a lot of exciting stuff happening there, like being able to do a QSIP search, which is C-U-S-I-P, and that's a search you can do that will give you evidentiary material that, uh, uh, that the loan has been securitized, which means you can demand to see who has the bill, the alleged bill or the alleged agreement, uh, because they need to come to court with what they call prima facie or forensic evidence. Show me the contract that has your signature and my signature on it, uh, and and uh, if you can s prove that they've securitized it, it's uh, there's been a f f quite a few cases in the United States at least that have been dismissed. So, um, you know, because what I think that essentially bank... means is the bank that's coming after you doesn't hold, doesn't own the debt anymore. They've sold it on. They are acting as a middleman, and they actually have no right to sue you. Um, that's correct. The person who actually owns the debt is the one with the right to sue you. But yeah, because you even didn't even have a contract with the person who may now own the debt, 
you had yeah. no knowledge of the fact that it was unsold, so there's no disclosure. Um, there's a number of things there that um, a number of avenues that people can use to to argue their case. Um, two two of the main ones, Lisa, just quickly would be, um, where did the money come from? We ask when we write our letters, we've got a four stage administration process, and the first letter is a, a request for better and further particulars, and we say. Great. Uh, show us where the money came from. Show us a contract, and then answer a few questions about the establishment of money. Um, because if people watch, uh, I guess Zeitgeist to the addendum, uh, Money Masters is a good one. Um, they'll understand that when they create money, they create a certain amount of principal. So if they charge you interest on the principal, there's a very simple mathematical question: Where does the interest come from? The answer is that it can only come from the establishment or the release of more principal. So if all the if all the loans around the world were to be called in now, it is mathematically impossible for them to be paid. And if that's the case, it's unreasonable. It's an unconscionable contract. How can you create a contract that is impossible to fulfill? Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. It's absolutely mathematically impossible. Um, so what I would ask people is this. If at the end of World War II, there were roughly two billion people on planet Earth, and now, 80 years later, there are roughly six and a half billion people, and all of those people are living under rooftops, and all of those rooftops are about 14 times more expensive than they were at the end of World War II. Where did all that money come from? That's a lot of money. So people really need to understand about the creation of money, um, and this is one of the big court cases in America many years ago where they, uh, the judge actually said, only God has the power to create something out of nothing. So it's so it's audacious, the fact that they can create money out of nothing and then charge you interest on it. It's, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to going to court in the next little while because, um, you know, I'll, I'll be saying to the judges, do you want to be seen as a war criminal in the future? Because this is the one of the biggest crimes against humanity. There are people killing themselves, families falling apart, um, all sorts of stuff, and this will definitely be seen as one of the biggest crimes against humanity. So, no, I, uh, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Um, so um, they're, the questions, they're the questions that we ask that the banks to date have never answered. Never, ever once have they uh, even attempted to answer some of these questions. No, well, they can't because to, to do so would be to expose the fraud. Mm -hmm. uh, catch 22 for them. Mm -hmm. So uh, to our audience, it is truthology.org.au there is a link on my website at lisaremharrison.com you can use that to go straight there um, I really want to thank you for talking to me today um, is there anything else that you want to leave people with or make sure that they understand I think you'd have to summarize by saying it really is people's responsibility to, uh, to make the effort to find out what's been going on and make the effort about the very positive solutions that they can have. One of the things that we're doing, Lisa, is um, talking a lot about community. And community doesn't have to be geographically um, restrained to just living, going out and moving on a farm. It can be a whole heap of people that get together from opposite sides of the city that just catch up once a fortnight and, uh, and maybe share produ produce, share ideas and just have their kids get together. We, we really have created a society of, a society of individuals. And that's what they want. How many people don't even know who their neighbour is? They don't even know. They maybe have a bit of a, an uncomfortable wave when they're putting the bins out on a Thursday morning, but nobody really sort of uh, mixes together. So we're very community-based, and we're excited. We've got a big meeting this Sunday with about 100 people coming from all over the country uh, because we've found some land that we want to move to. And um, it's not running away. It's running too. Um, and, um, you know, it, there's, there's no thought that it'll be a utopian oh, we'll all sit around and make love and pick berries. I mean, I'm sure there'll be some of that going on. But you know what? But things will come up, and we want them to come up because we all, you know, people watch seven hours of TV and, and self-medicate every night to go to sleep. Their issues don't come up. They, they end up like my father, who died at the age of 60 with lots of money and lots of status and no idea who he was. So I guess, I guess for, uh, for us, we're happy to get out onto this community and um, for things to come up and for us in a really loving environment, work, work them out. Um, so I, I think that's how I'd finish is by saying times are changing and, uh, you know, buckle up and take some responsibility because uh, not everybody's going to come out of this in such a great shape in the next little while. No, agreed. And mm. I, I'll add to the community thing too, Bruce Lipton 
sent out a, a newsletter recently and he had spent a great deal of 2010, I think he said he was home for like five weeks, um, traveling, traveling the world. And what he has witnessed right around the world is these communities starting up, um, whether they're, mm. they're kin communities based on, or the kingdoms based on the, um, the writings of Anastasia, or whether they're yeah. communities that have come up uh, simply out of necessity in places where uh, food is short or uh, jobs are non-existent and people are starting to come together. You know, um, necessity is the mother of invention, so they say, so these things are coming up. Um, or by choice, people are feeling the, mm. the desire and the need and the pull to get back to Mother Nature, to get back to community. Um, and they're just springing up all over the country. I know, all over the world, but I, I know of several that are starting up here um, in Australia. Um, yeah. As we speak, they're in, in the groundworks and many that are already established. It's amazing. I saw a thing with Jamie Oliver a few years ago where he went to the north of England on a schools project and he was holding up a garlic, for instance, and none of the kids knew what a garlic was. Then a broccoli. None of the kids even knew where their food was. Their potato all came in the shape of smiley faces. Um, you know, their diets were appalling. So people are so removed from where their food came from. And let me say, the Queensland floods has been a big eye-opener for a few people in terms of how reliant they are on the system. Mm. Um, because uh, supermarkets emptied out. And even down here at Byron Bay, where I live, we weren't even affected by the floods, but the supermarkets still emptied out of all produce, milk, and water. It was, it was amazing to see. I will finish by saying, just quickly, um, and it's not, uh, it's not fear-mongering, but um, I would store some food. Uh, we, we've stored about nine months' worth of food, uh, Steph and I, and um, I can't tell you how nice it feels to just know it's there. It's like the old insurance saying, I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. And uh, so we, do, we went, went and spent a few grand and just um, we stored up on lots of stuff like tin tomato, uh, not tin tomatoes, jarred tomatoes, chickpeas, protein powders, spirulina, rice. You know, it's not going to be gourmet food, but, um, you know, when things change, um, they can change very quickly. And hopefully the Queensland floods and what's gone on in Egypt and other parts of the world will wake people up to that. I, I have Richard Yap staying with me. Um, I think you know Richard. Mm -hmm. uh, he was caught in he was caught in Kuala Lumpur during some civil unrest there, and we were talking last night because I was caught in the Philippines when Ferdinand Marcos was uh, in, and there was a little coup broke out, and within a few hours the banks shut, the airport shut, the supermarkets were emptied out, and there was gunfire in the street. So I mean, Manila was a is a big city, and I I've seen firsthand how humanity can uh, quickly disintegrate into survival and uh, when people have got hungry kids and they're hungry themselves it's not uh, not a great situation and no, um, it can get very ugly very quickly with the imminent crash of the economies there is going to be some uh, some unrest oh it's happening now i mean um, there are food riots in half a dozen places around the world right now um, i've been talking to people in the u.s who say already things are getting to the point where they can't afford food um, mm. i've spoken to i've done interviews with george Cavasilis. Um, which has been more of on the ascension side of things, and and you know we've talked about uh, preparation and storing food and trying to get off the grid and become independent. Um, mm. So yeah, I'm I'm in agreement with you there that um, some food storage is is even here in Australia. It's I mean we feel so far removed from all of that. Um, quite insulated. Yeah, mm. we do. But like you said, all it takes is um, a cyclone, <laughs> like we've had in Queensland or flooding, mm. like we've had in Queensland, to change things very, very quickly. Mm. Um, and there's more of that set to come. I mean, what day is it today? Friday, Tuesday, I believe, was some major, the biggest solar flare I recorded, as far as I know. Yeah. Um, and it's, a bit, it's due to hit today. Okay. And mm. they're talking about power outs, um, communication outs, it might be why our internet connection's doing what it's doing. Uh -huh. um, so, I mean, that's not that's completely beyond our control. Um, yes. And if it was to take the power out, who knows how long it would take to put it back on? And yeah. how many people that, have got more than just a day's food in the fridge? Absolutely. That's one one question to uh, ask people is what would happen if the power went out? That's that's all that would have to happen. There'd be no ATMs no petrol, no water. People don't realise in the big cities, where do you think the water is, is uh, how do you think it's supplied? It's not gravity. It's fed by massive pumps. 
Mm. And you know, the power going out would be a very big leveler. Mark, just let, to let's leave people with um, some practical tips on what they can do. If you're being hounded right now by a credit card company or a debt collector or uh, you're getting, whether it's mail or phone calls or visits to the door, is there anything you can tell people that um, to just to give them some confidence in dealing with this? Because it's scary and it's intimidating and uh, it's threatening and it's meant to be, of course. Yeah. Well, what they're trying to do is contract you because the whole law system is based on contracting. And so uh, it's quite quite powerful to hold a mirror up, I call it. So, um, for instance, if a debt collector or a bank calls, um, I used to have a big saying, and this is in the first instances of what we ask our clients to say is something like this. Oh, gee, it's been a while since I did this, but uh, um, look, that person can't come to the phone. Obviously, the person can't because the person's dead, right? A person is a corporation, but look, that person can't come to the phone. However, you are invited to send anything that you have in the form of communication in writing and in writing only to P.O. Box, whatever it is. I don't consent to this phone call being recorded, nor do I consent to any other phone calls or emails, everything in writing. If you do, uh, I will be taking the full force of the law under the breach of the Trade Practices Act. Thank you and have a good day and hang up. They'll try and engage you in conversation and contract, but essentially what you're doing is noticing them, put it in writing. As it's written, so shall it be done, because they will be recording the, con uh, the conversation trying to contract you. But if you want to have a bit of fun, and, and a lot of our clients, when they realize who they are and, and, um, and, and want to have a bit of fun, they might ring up and say, oh, hello, is Mark there? Yes. Uh, so, no, who, who's calling? Oh, it's Tracy from Citibank. Uh, Mark, we just need to confirm your full name, address, and date of birth. And uh, I would say in return, great. Yeah, Tracy, you go first. And there'll be a, a pause on the other end of the phone. You say, Tracy, if you give me your full name, your home address, and your date of birth, then I'm happy to give you mine. And they say, I oh, see, so we can't do that. And so, well, you rang me. You rang me out of the blue. How do I even know you're Tracy from Citibank? Um, and they'll hang up every time. So it's fun. And, you know, the, the clients actually really enjoy being able to uh, have a bit of fun with it. And the reason they ask you those specific questions is because they need to get those three points of jurisdiction over you. Um, That's correct. And it's the same they whether need, it's a... Sorry? They need you to join to yourself. To your uh, to your agent in commerce or your corporation, that's what they're asking you to do. Yes, they don't know that. We've got police uh, from state and federal level. Level. Uh, level. We've got um, lawyers, and it's amazing that uh, when they come across this information, they go, "Ah, oh, that's why we said things that way." You know, especially the police. They're trained to write their tickets with your name in all capital letters. Yet your address can be in upper and lower case. They're trained to ask you, "Do you understand?" You know, they're they're trained to get your consent. The law cannot work without your consent. All you have to keep saying is, I don't understand and I don't consent. And uh, it messes them up. <laughs> but, you know, I guess we just spoke quickly off air about just have a bit of fun with it because all they're trying to do is contract you th with you. And if you know who you are, uh, you, you get them to put whatever their claim is in in writing and make them commercially uh, uh, liable under penalties of perjury. It shortens them up pretty quick. Mm. Okay, well, mm. thank you for that. Um... And please, again, everyone, go to Truthology and, and uh, have a look. Um, see if you resonate with the information that Mark's trying to share with you. And thanks again, Mark. All right. Thank you.